Hi, I'm Rose Cushing, host of Carolina Hoofbeats TV. I'm so glad you joined us today because we caught up with Catherine Stancliffe at North Star Veterinary Clinic. She was doing a saddle fitting clinic there. And you know, with so many saddles on the market, you have to wonder, how do you know which one to choose? What saddle is going to make my horse the most comfortable, give me the best ride, and be in my price range? So I think Catherine can demystify saddle buying for us. Let's start out as Catherine explains to us saddle balance. Hi, my name is Catherine Stancliffe with Stancliffe Saddle Fitting and also associated with Steuben North America. I'm a certified Steuben Custom Fitter. I've been with Steuben for um, over three years now. I'm also trained independently with a master fitter named Mike Scott in South Carolina, so I can evaluate and fit other saddles besides Steuben. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about kind of the, the basics and the overall picture of sizing a saddle to fit a horse um, and all the things that kind of go into making that fit happen and making the horse as comfortable as possible. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about the balance of the saddle. Um, we have different types of balance with these saddles. Um, one of the most important ones is the balance pommel to cantle. Uh, that's going to vary depending on the style of saddle, the brand of the saddle, you know, if it has a really high cantle like some dressage saddles are designed for, um, if it's a flatter seat, if it's a deeper seat. Um, so I'll just give you the general rundown of um, how we do it with Steuben and then kind of a, a rough guideline for other saddles. Um, this is what we would call a flatter seated jump saddle and it is meant to sit balanced pommel to cantle. It should be very straight. Um, if it was a deeper seated jump saddle, I would want to see the pommel sit maybe an inch lower than the cantle. That would be roughly where it should be balanced. Um, and it's going to be about the same with the dressage saddle, about an inch lower in the pommel than where the cantle sits. Uh, that can vary, again, like I said, depending on the brand that you're, you're looking at. Um, some saddles are designed with a very high cantle and a lower pommel, so then you kind of have to look at where the deepest point of the seat is, and if that sits um, balanced at the deepest point of the seat, that, that's the lowest point of the saddle. Um, so that, like I said, it's going to vary from saddle to saddle and from brand to brand. Um, why this is important is because your balance is what allows proper weight distribution to be um, even across the whole structure of the tree, which is the structure inside the saddle. Um, so you have even bearing surface along the whole panel. If you have a saddle that's sitting really low in the pommel, you're going to feel the tree points on the horse and go, oh, this is really tight. He's not very comfortable with that. I need to go wider. And then you're going to have it push down more and more, and you're adding more weight, um, more imbalance to the front end of the saddle. You're going to have a horse that's very sore, um, might not be as willing to go to work for you, um, not very happy with that, where in this case, we'd be a lot better off going with something a little bit narrower so that lifts up the front of the saddle, rebalances it from pommel to cantle, gives us better uh, weight-bearing surface from pommel to cantle, and that's going to be a lot more even across his back. Conversely, if we have a saddle that's too narrow, and the pommel sits way too high, you're gonna have all the weight of the rider falling to the back of the saddle, back of the cantle, and depending on uh, the panel type, you may have excessive pressure at the rear of the panel, could have muscle soreness through there, um, the saddle might scoot up the neck as you're riding, you're gonna have excessive movement, and again, the horse is gonna be sore um, more towards his loins, so that won't be very happy. Um, you also have to consider the lateral balance, which is the balance from side to side, which can be affected by a lot of different things. Um, the saddle can be unbalanced from side to side because the horse's musculature is different or asymmetrical. Um, we see a lot of these on thoroughbreds coming off the track where they've been running in one direction for so long, they build up one side of their body more than the other. The saddle sits kind of cockeyed on them. And to remedy that situation, we may need to do um, a custom shimming for the horse so that we can even out the saddle. Again, getting that bearing surface from left to right, nice and even, um, so we have even weight distribution across the horse's back. The other things that can throw this off can be the way the horse goes, especially if you have horses with uneven feet. Maybe one, one foot toes in more than another or toes out more than another can cause the scapula to run back into the saddle move the saddle as you're riding in it, um, 
kind of throw it all over the place and fishtail. That horse may need something a little bit different as far as shimming or flocking. Or you occasionally get a rider that's very crooked in the saddle and might need to go visit a chiropractor themselves and they're posting along and they're just throwing the saddle all over the place. So that's yeah, eventually that's going to cause the flocking to smash down in one way or another or the tree to twist more one way than another. So we may have to do something a little bit different to allow even weight bearing surface for, for that rider where the horse may be mostly symmetrical but we have to make sure it's balanced for the rider as well. Um, one last note on the balance of the saddle. The saddle is balanced properly, whether it's you know, a flat seat or a deeper seat and whatever the um, rule of thumb should be for that. Um, if we have it balanced properly and we're actually making contact with the withers within that correct balance, the saddle does not fit. Um, there's no point in time where we can be making contact with the horse's spine and with the bony prominences. Um, so even if the saddle is sitting correctly as far as balance goes, if it's not lifted up off the spine and off the withers, then we need to reevaluate the fit, start over from square one, and remedy that before we can move forward. Um, and I would also clarify that any kind of saddle should not be making contact with the spine and with the withers. So that's going to be a Western saddle, an English saddle, an endurance saddle. If we have any pressure on there, and it, it may start out as a horse that just doesn't want to perform as well, um, can end up with sores on the wither, uh, which may start out as white hairs, turn into soreness, turn into maybe being crabby when you're tacking up. Those are all very, very bad signs that you have some poor saddle fit going on. Hey, my name is Daniel Rayner. Numerous time qualifier to the Southern Finals Rodeo, won team ruffins across the country. I've used Mule City Feeds since I was a kid. Always great quality feed. And I use complete horse feed. It already has hay in it. If you're tired of chasing hay, then give Paul Dunn a call today at Mule City Feeds. I thank him for all the effort and time he puts into quality feed. Hey there, I'm Christine Long, owner of Pineview Veterinary Hospital here in Bolton, North Carolina. We are an exclusive large animal veterinary practice. Um, we provide 24-7 emergency care and routine services for horses, cows, sheep, goats, llamas, alpacas, and pigs. We are currently a staff of two full-time veterinarians, myself and Dr. Leslie Jarrett, and we have a wonderful secretary, Donna Jacobs. We provide veterinary services to the northeastern part of South Carolina and the southeastern part of North Carolina. So if the need arises, give us an opportunity to serve you. And the next segment, Catherine's going to explain to us all about weight distribution of the panels and how it varies from horse and disciplines. Consider the weight distribution on the panels themselves, which may sound a little redundant, but we're talking about uh, against the horse. So if you are to run your hand underneath the panel as it's sitting on the horse, and this is preferably done when it's girthed down a little snugly so you can really feel how it kind of settles onto the horse's back. Even better to have a rider on the saddle and be able to run your hand underneath it and feel how that changes. Um, you're going to have some different needs for different types of horses. Horses that are going to perform more collected work, you do want to have a very slight bridge at the center. When I say bridge, that means a slight loss of contact in the very center of the panel. It shouldn't be an excessive bridge because if we have a lot of room underneath the center of the panel, you have excessive weight on the front and the back of the panel, which is going to cause soreness. But if it's totally flush through the whole panel on a horse, you're going to ask to perform collected movements as they round their back and come into the saddle. Um, you're going to have something that's going to tip off the center of the panel. It's going to kind of rock back and forth. Whereas if you have a slight bridge, a slight concave shape um, to the panel itself, then they have somewhere to go with the musculature in their back and able to round into that and perform those collective movements properly. Um, it's also important to note that there's different styles of saddles as far as panels that sit flatter and ones that sit more angled and that's going to depend on what kind of horse you have. Um, if you have very flat panels on a very A-frame type of horse, even further um, back in their back, then it's going to put more pressure to the center of the panel, um, closer to the spinous processes, and it's not going to use that whole width of the panel to distribute the weight, so you'll have less contact at the sides. Um, that means that we have more pounds per square inch across a narrowed surface of the panel, which may cause soreness over time. 
Um, and conversely, if we have panels that are too A-framed for a very flat back torse, we're going to be putting too much pressure to the outside of the panel. Again, narrowing the bearing surface, increasing the pounds per square inch across the saddle. Um, so that can also cause soreness because we're not having even distribution across the panels laterally. It's also important to make sure that the saddle fits you correctly as well. If a rider is in a saddle that is too small for their behind, that's going to cause your seat bones to creep up the back of the cantle. It's going to put more pressure to the back of the saddle. Again, more weight is going to go to the back of that panel, kind of grind it into the horse's back. Whereas if you sat on a saddle that was long enough in the seat for that rider, you're going to go back to the deepest point of the seat. You're going to be using the whole tree and the whole shape of the panel to absorb your weight um, instead of putting it all to the back if it's too small. Conversely, if it's too large, you're just going to feel like you're swimming around in a whole bunch of saddle or it might feel really hard because you're sitting on structures that normally the rider wouldn't be sitting on in the properly fitted saddle. So always make sure that you can also fit in the saddle yourself, especially after it already fits the horse. Hi, my name is Charles Ramsey from Lost Creek Cattle Company. Uh, this is one of our stallions we use. His name's Hairpin Blue Checks. We, uh, we heal on him. We rope calves on him. We do mounted shooting on him. We raise about 35 coats off of him a year. He's, good. He's a great individual, good-minded. He can go any direction. Uh, basically, we raise, we got about 160 head of horses. We're gonna bring you a set of coats up here to Everything Equine. Probably bring you six coats. I'm gonna try to match them up best I can where you'll have a good group of horses to start with. Whether you're looking for a, a trail horse or a working cow horse, reiner, whatever you're looking for, we probably have him. If you buy anything off this course right here, he's gonna be good-minded and sure enough have the ability to do what anybody wants to do. We also need to consider the movement and position of the saddle with the rider mounted in the arena, wherever you're riding, in motion with the horse. We cannot accurately fit the saddle to the horse or the rider without seeing you go, without seeing the rider mounted, preferably the rider that's going to be using the saddle the most. We do a lot of fittings where people go, oh, you should watch my trainer ride. We really need to see you ride, because if you ride the horse the most, we need to see how you are in the saddle, how you move your body, how the horse moves his posture with you to make sure everything fits correctly. And the reason why I say that is we can see certain things in the aisle statically that totally change the second we go to the arena. Um, we see horses that like to lift up a lot through their withers, so they completely change the balance of the saddle. Ones that round their back more from behind, that's gonna change the balance of the cantle. Some horses that have maybe a little bit of an irregular movement, so as we watch the horse go, you might see a saddle that was totally stable in the aisle and then in motion it's moving all over the place which can be caused by a variety of things whether it be um, you know needing a little bit more flocking somewhere to a tree size that's not quite accurate for that horse to a tree shape that doesn't quite match the horse's back whether it be too curved or too straight for that horse's body type to again a rider that is maybe a little twisty in the saddle a little unbalanced had a hip replacement, had, needs a chiropractic adjustment, an infinite number of things that can change as we move to the arena. So it's very important to make sure that your fitter takes you out there, watches you ride, watches your horse go, and especially watches from the back. And the reason I say that is because as we're considering the structures that, <laughs> that we can, <laughs> as we consider the structures that we can have weight bearing on and the ones that we can't, we need to make sure as the horse goes, the saddle doesn't slip off to the side and put pressure directly onto the spine. Maybe when he travels to the right, he drops his shoulder a little bit and it causes the saddle to shift over to the side. It should always sit roughly centered on the horse's back um, and make sure that the, the spine is cleared through the movement, both directions, you know, at different speeds to make sure that it's staying the same throughout the whole ride and that's going to make your horse the happiest in the long run. And the next question Catherine's going to talk about for us is how do you size the saddle? One of the most important questions we get is 
how do we size the saddle? And a lot of people have some misconceptions on what it means when we talk about the size of the saddle. They look at their horse's rib cage and go, oh, he's really broad and really wide. He needs a wide saddle. Don't consider that their wither sticks up really high. And we also need to make sure that we're clearing the wither. So the important measurement we're looking for on the horse is the angle of this area right behind the scapula. That's where the tree point is going to sit, which is the first part of the saddle that takes the weight of the rider. So we need to make sure it's narrow enough to clear over the horse's wither um, and also to keep the saddle in balance across their whole back. So there's a couple of things we need to take into consideration for that. Like I said, the angle of the tree point in the front, um, that's going to determine what kind of clearance we have over the wither. Um, the bars within the tree, which is the structure further back, needs to be somewhat matched to the horse's side. So if the horse is very A-framed, they need more upright bars to match. If the horse is very broad-backed, they need a little bit broader bars to sit evenly across their back. If you mix and match those, you're going to have uneven pressure across the panel and maybe excessive movement depending on the horse and the saddle. Um, and also the way that the horse's rib cage comes out, that may also come into play with how the saddle fits, but that may be something that we can fix with a different panel type on a different saddle, something with, if he's got a very broad rib cage, something with less flocking or a shorter panel so that the rib cage can kind of fill out the rest of the rider's leg by itself instead of being stuffed out by a panel further. Are you thinking about a career with horses? I love this. We love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. We know. You'll love it too. Determining the shape that your horse is, that it may be difficult for somebody that's only seen one type of horse, if they only work with thoroughbreds or they only work with quarter horse types or warm blood types. Um, it just is kind of the, the general terms we use to determine if you were to do a cross section of his back right here, would he look like an A or like a kind of a teardrop shape with his rib cage or would he look flat and round? Um, and that's going to be a broader horse versus an A-framed horse. Um, other things we need to consider are the length of the back that we have to work with, and we want the saddle to be sitting behind the horse's scapula and then before the end of the rib cage, and we can find that on most horses by, it'll be a little harder on the chubbier ones, easy on the thoroughbreds. You can kind of run your hand down from the hip to where you feel the last rib. So I can feel the last rib on his rib cage right here follow it up into his, uh, his spine. So this is gonna be the last point on his back that he can carry a saddle. So I wouldn't want him to be in a saddle where the panel is sitting past that point because we've left the um, bearing surface and the weight bearing structures of the horse's back. And I also don't wanna come too far forward and have the saddle sitting on top of the scapula, which we can feel kind of by running your hand along the shoulder and you can feel where the bone kind of drops off into muscle right here. So we can't go in front of that area as well. The levelness of the horse's back is also going to determine what tree size they're going to need. If we have a horse that's very uphill, we're going to have to fit a little bit narrower to again make sure that we have clearance over the wither and balance through that saddle. If we have a horse that's downhill, we kind of also need to bring up the front of the saddle and make sure it's sitting parallel to the ground, not to the horse's back. Because if we have a horse that's very downhill, this horse came down like that, and that's a little bit exaggerated, and we had a saddle that matched that angle, all the weight would go to the front of the saddle and put more pressure behind the scapula. Um, and you might have a saddle that kind of flips up in the back and moves around. Whereas one that would be balanced more parallel is going to have better even weight bearing surface across the back. Um, and then again, a horse that's very uphill might need some kind of lift or wedge behind or a larger gusseted panel, maybe even a different shaped tree to make sure the cantle comes up to meet the pommel and be balanced on the horse's back. We're looking at billets and I've now replaced the saddle with one with a narrower tree size. It's sitting more balanced pommel to cantle. Um, again, that's something we would assess further with a rider mounted to make sure it stayed accurate. 
These billets, they still come forward a little bit, um, but they're lined up much better with the rib cage. And this is a, a jump saddle with a more forward flap. They kind of want to hang a little bit more forward anyways. And if we really needed to, you can, you can play around with some different kind of girths depending on what horse you're looking at. But if the billets are way out of whack, like the first saddle we looked at, putting some kind of wonder girth on isn't going to fix that whole problem. It's still going to have too much movement in it. There's going to be other issues causing that beyond just the way that the billets lay. So we need to look at all the other possible causes first before we go to trying different girths to remedy the problem. This is our field of dreams. At the heart of these flowers is a decade of non-GMO crop development bringing together a community of independent UK farmers who share our belief that we are what we care about. Together, we're cultivating an omega-rich crop that not only supports your horse's health, it also supports the very world that sustains us. With every master batch of ahi flower oil we create, we're providing the richest plant-based, ocean-friendly source of omegas for you and your horse. Ahi flower oil, balanced equine omegas that your horse will love. Another thing we have to consider with different saddles on the market, different styles, different brands, are the panel type that are, that's on the saddle. Uh, Steuben primarily uses a wool flocked panel, which gives us a lot of options between different sizes and shapes of panels to being able to flock it asymmetrically for some horses that need it, being able to customize that flocking for the horse it's being used for, which can change throughout its lifetime, can change throughout the saddle's lifetime if you use that saddle on multiple horses. Um, so that gives you a lot of options with the wool flocking, be able to change it and adjust it throughout the lifetime of the horse, throughout the lifetime of the saddle. Whereas conversely, if you use a foam flock saddle, um, it can work for some horses. It takes less maintenance, um, but you cannot adjust it as much. It's a little bit denser, not generally recommended for a lot of the really high withered types because um, we just can't get enough lift through the panel to clear over the wither and the spine as we can with wool. There are other type of panels on the market as well, including air flock panels and some others. And it just depends on what works best for you and your horse and your budget. Some important notes for us to end with is that there's lots of different things that can be affecting the fit for both you and your horse beyond even what we've talked about here today. Um, there's a lot of different features that can come into play that a saddle fitter that's going out to barns every day looking at hundreds of different horses they're going to see that immediately, whereas you might struggle for weeks or months trying to figure out why does my saddle not fit? Why is it my horse sore because of it? Um, so it's important to get in touch with a saddle fitter in your area that's respectable, that you trust their opinion so that they can help guide you along finding that perfect fit for both you and your horse. Um, it's important to make sure that you listen to your horse. If he's suddenly acting really unruly, if he's bolting or bucking under saddle and he's never done that before, if he's really sore in his back or he doesn't want to work and he's really lazy, you need to listen to him and figure out what's the cause of this. It's not a great idea to immediately go to, oh, I need a stronger bit, I need a bigger whip, I need a better trainer. Look at your horse and they really want to perform for you, they really usually want to do a good job. So always make sure there's no pain, there's no poor saddle fit, there's nothing else going on before we move on to any kind of harsher training methods. Um, if the saddle is comfortable for you, but it's hurting your horse, the saddle's gotta change. That's the number one thing we have with Steuben, is the horse always comes first, always. So we can't sacrifice that just because the rider says, oh, I really like this saddle though. We need to make sure it fits for the horse first, otherwise neither of you are going to be happy or you might even get hurt as a result. So that's not a good thing. Our end goal with horses is to do no harm, enjoy riding, get out there, do what we love to do, prolong our horses' lives as much as possible, improve their lives as much as possible. So with that thought in mind, proper fit means better riding. As you can see from this segment, there's a lot of details in finding the proper saddle fit. And if you stay tuned next week, We'll give you a few more details thrown in there to mix so you can be sure that when you're ready to buy a new saddle, you get the right one. So I hope you enjoyed part one. Part two will be next week, and thank you for watching. It's that time again. 
The Everything Equine Expo is returning to the Southeast Agricultural and Events Center in Lumberton, North Carolina on August 25th and 26th. This year's action-packed expo features a visit from Best of America horseback host, Tom Say. Our colt starting competition returns with six of the top competitors in the United States. This is sponsored by Pineview Veterinary Clinic. The winner will receive a custom-made saddle and a buckle, not to mention bragging rights. Horses this year are provided by Lost Creek Cattle Company out of Tennessee, and all the horses will be for sale after the event on Sunday. We have amazing clinicians, demos, shopping, and food. This year, we've added a little dancing in the dirt to the program on Saturday night, featuring the Ray Band. We've also added an extreme trail obstacle course competition. Tickets go on sale June 1st. For more information, go to CushingMediaProductions.com and click on Expo. Hope to see you there. Hi, my name is Dr. Kim Crivett with North Star Veterinary Hospital, and this is Dr. Sarah Robertson. And we are your equine veterinarians here at North Star Veterinary Hospital. And what I'd like to talk to you today is about vaccinations and how important they are. We vaccinate for Eastern, Western, Tetanus, and West Nile as one vaccine group. The second one would be equine herpes virus, EHV, and the third would be rabies. Now, we consider a horse that has not been vaccinated in the last six months to be naive, meaning that it does not have any memory of any vaccines. So if you have just received a horse and don't know its vaccine history, or they said, oh, it's been up to date on vaccines, but we don't know the date, it's better to vaccinate them now and again in three weeks. Then your horse will be, have full immunity for six months. If you buy your vaccines from a big box store, you are, do not know how those vaccines arrived there, if they arrived in the proper temperature and if they've been handled properly. So this is why we recommend that you get your horses vaccinated by us here at North Star Veterinary Hospital by your equine veterinarians, Dr. Sarah Robertson and myself, Dr. Kim Crivett. Thank you very much. The rural American lifestyle. It's how we work. It's how we play. It's how we learn and how we enjoy the finer things in life. How we take care of our animals tend to the land. It's a way of life. Has been for hundreds of years. Now there's a whole new way for rural America to watch TV.